so uh, thank you for the uh, the invitation to to be here. When we think about the epigenome, which is my task, it's a much bigger challenge than thinking about the uh, the genome. All of a sudden, we have many marks. Every cell has a different epigenome, and each stage of development has a different epigenome. So uh, the challenge is huge, and my task is really just to provide a background of some of the epigenetic modifications and the differences in potential vulnerabilities of germ cells, both male and female germ cells, um, uh, for when we come to talk about uh, smoking. And I will acknowledge, again, that female germ cells are often left, left out. They're very difficult to, to study. But there are some studies uh, starting to, to come out. Okay, so um, for the uh, epigenome, the key features uh, of the epigenome are DNA methylation and chromatin uh, modifications. More recently, we've added to that small RNAs. The uh, major uh, aspect of the epigenome is that it uh, can be heritable and also reversible. Um, an epimutate mutation refers to the loss of a normal epigenetic mark that then can influence expression over long periods of time. And that's where the heritability aspect of the epigenetic marks is very critical. And the epigenome provides us with plasticity and the ability to respond to uh, the environment. So uh, again, critical for when we're thinking about uh, smoking. The epigenome has become more complex over uh, time. We now know of many different histone uh, modifications uh, which can influence gene expression. Uh, what we know most about in the epigenome is uh, DNA methylation. We can now uh, look at DNA methylation at very high resolution, uh, much more easily than ever uh, before. But we also know of other modifications one is a breakdown product of 5-methylcytosine, 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. We're really just starting to understand what some of these other modifications uh, mean for gene expression and when they, uh, and they occur. Uh, the whole uh, field of RNA-based mechanisms working with these other modifications uh, has come along as very important and likely quite involved in heritability of uh, exposure effects. So I'd just like to reiterate that by showing these uh, epigenetic mechanisms which uh, really work together so that there may be one mechanism that sets up the, the others um, and a uh, modification of any one of them can lead to an alteration in, in another. And we now know that uh, you need um, opening of chromatin in order for DNA methylation to occur. Uh, you can have DNA methylation defects that then uh, can lead to RNA-based uh, defects. Okay, so um, just the very simplistic uh, aspect of epigenetics is uh, the uh, interaction of uh, histone marks and uh, DNA methylation to either lead to an open chromatin conformation or a closed uh, conformation. So here you have repressive histone marks and hypermethylated promoter that can shut down genes. And that was probably first seen uh, for tumor suppressor genes in the cancer field um, and has been uh, quite, quite interesting um, in large studies. So uh, there are clear interactions of the genome and uh, the epigenome, um, but the epigenome can be affected by environment and age, and even if you have the same genetic background of twins, you can have a different phenotype later on in life because of effects on the epigenome. So this is an early study showing uh, the twins, their methylation at three years of age, and then the differences at 50 years of age. So the age and the environment affecting uh, the epigenome and influencing uh, disease. 
So uh, most of the data that we have is based on uh, DNA methylation effects. So I'm going to uh, spend most of the time uh, talking about DNA methylation. But uh, there's been a lot of, um, of work on, now on chromatin and on, um, on RNA. And that will come up later in the talk and also when we talk about smoking. So if we talk about DNA methylation itself, there are challenges just looking at DNA methylation. 80% of the CPGs in the, the genome are methylated. Uh, that's 20 to 30 million sites, so 30 million sites in, in human. Uh, they're in retrotransposons that have come into our genome over time. They're in uh, single copy genes, uh, special, especially in imprinted genes where only one allele will be uh, methylated. And uh, importantly, there is reprogramming of DNA methylation, which will help us understand which um, epi mutations might be heritable and which ones might uh, not be. Genomic imprinting is a critical uh, mark that occurs on either the parental or the, the, the paternal or the maternal allele. Uh, about 100 different genes involved. But these genes are very important for uh, development, growth, the placenta, and postnatally, so that alterations in uh, either the mark you get from your mother or your father uh, can have critical effects postnatally, because if there's an epi mutation, it cannot be corrected after the germline development uh, phase. So there's been a lot of attention on these marks. And when we think about vulnerabilities, um, we think about the timing that these uh, patterns go on in the uh, germline. Uh, but we're now learning that these differentially methylated regions between the alleles um, extend beyond imprinted genes. And so studies are uh, working out what those, uh, those are. So when we think about vulnerabilities, DNA methylation acquisition occurs at very different times in the two uh, germ lines. So in uh, the ovary, uh, in, during, in utero development, as the ovary is developing, um, DNA methylation is initially erased in the primordial germ cells and then is only um, re-initiated after birth as the oocytes grow right before, in the adult female, right before um, ovulation in the mature oocyte. In contrast, in male germ cells in uh, the testis, DNA methylation is again erased in the primordial germ cells across most of those 30 million sites. Um, but then it is reestablished in the developing male germ cells uh, before uh, the uh, time of birth. And then there's a remodeling uh, of those programs in postnatal spermatogenesis. But the major acquisition period is prenatally in utero, and that is a potential time for um, exposures to, to play a role. So um, one thing we we're learning now from really high-resolution studies comparing uh, DNA methylation, histone marks, and RNA uh, expression is that often uh, RNA and chromatin marks will uh, precede DNA methylation acquisition. So these marks work uh, together and uh, reinforce each other. And uh, the marking that occurs and the mechanisms uh, in one germline differ from the setting up in the other germline. So it's incredibly complex, even for something uh, as simple as uh, DNA methylation. Okay, so the, the um, uh, reprogramming window that I just mentioned is shown uh, here. The first one is the primordial germ cells, where you reprogram between generations, supposedly to prevent epi mutations from being transmitted across generations, uh, but not you don't go down to a zero uh, state. Uh, there's still some methylation at some sites that is present, but certainly imprinted genes are completely erased and most of the genome is. There's this methylation in the male germline before birth, the female germline after birth. The uh, egg and the sperm come to, together with different uh, contributions of methylation patterns um, and chromatin patterns to the uh, embryo. There's a further genome-wide demethylation and then a remethylation right at the uh, time of implantation over a couple of day period uh, where the inner cell mass and the trophectoderm cells receive different uh, degrees of methylation. 
So this maintenance is for imprinted genes, but it's also for other sequences. Um, this has, there have now been really high resolution studies done, and uh, this next uh, uh, review I'll uh, refer you to an epigenetics and chromatin from Tim Bester's group um, shows you a, a higher resolution view looking at different types of sequences. And you'll recognize here, there's the maternal genome on the top, the paternal on the bottom. There's this erasure period in both, here in the primordial germ cells and in the embryo. But the one thing that has been added is the types of sequences that don't get erased during these periods. And these are these uh, young CPG-rich transposons that are in our epigenome. So they are a potential a target for epimutations being passed across uh, generations. So um, spermatogenesis has been a target for a lot of study of uh, the, the epigenome. Um, and uh, as you'll see here, spermatogenesis is exceedingly uh, complex. And so uh, that the setting up of methylation patterns before birth is pretty key. They then need to be maintained in the dividing spermatogonia. There is some remodeling that occurs during spermatogenesis, but then uh, most is uh, completed uh, during the final steps of uh, spermiogenesis. The, I'd just like to reiterate here again the potential windows of vulnerability for male germ cell development would be in the prenatal period during the acquisition of, of methylation in uh, the gonad of the uh, developing male. But in the postnatal period, there is also throughout uh, development of male germ cells. In the spermatogonia, they have to maintain the patterns that were set, set on before birth, and uh, they acquire some new uh, methylation patterns uh, throughout uh, spermatogenesis. Special considerations for uh, sperm is that uh, most of the histones are replaced by protamines, but this is species-specific, so it will be different if you're looking at a mouse where 5% uh, of histones are retained and human 15% are uh, maintained. And the histone modifications are known to uh, play roles in uh, germ cell development. There's a, a real push to look at RNAs in uh, sperm, they can be transmitted to the embryos and influence embryo development, and there's evidence that exposures can affect those uh, RNAs. So we have to uh, look at a number of different aspects um, when we think about uh, sperm. Okay, so the epi if we go back now to thinking about eggs and sperm, the epigenetic contributions of eggs and sperm are different. Uh, the oocyte has different epigenetic marks than uh, the sperm, the cytoplasm of the oocyte contributes DNA methyltransferases and other uh, proteins that must maintain those marks, so those could be affected by exposures. And uh, there's a lot of uh, um, interest in the small RNAs in sperm that can uh, influence uh, exposures, or be influenced by exposures. Okay, so why are we interested in reproductive uh, epigenetics? Well, it's absolutely essential to have a healthy epigenome uh, for a healthy uh, baby. And we know that epigenetic defects in sperm are associated with infertility, can be influenced uh, by age and by exposures. And there have now been a lot of studies, mostly in, in animals, but also in uh, human populations. And uh, there's a growing uh, body of uh, uh, studies in animals showing that inheritance of epigenetic marks can influence uh, health. So there are a number of diseases associated with uh, altered DNA methylation patterns. Uh, cancer uh, has been a, an area of study for a very long time, but also male infertility, imprinting diseases, and there's a lot of interest in abnormalities in methylation associated with uh, neurodevelopment. Uh, Okay, so then the big question is, can these altered um, patterns be transmitted across generations and contribute to adverse outcomes in offspring? And it was considered because of the um, reprogramming that occurs in um, early development in the blastocyst that uh, 
a lot of the epi mutations would not be transmitted. But there's now uh, data suggesting that this does occur from a number of, of studies. So people are looking at the effects of exposures on uh, histone-bound DNA microRNAs and uh, DNA uh, methylation. So one of the uh, first uh, clear cases was for men with infertility who have uh, defects in imprinted genes. So they'll either have too low a methylation of a paternally methylated imprinted gene or a high level of methylation of a normally maternally methylated imprinted gene. I just showed what kinds of defects you have here. Can these be transmitted? Um, the study in 2009 looked at uh, 78 assisted reproduction conserved, conceived fetuses versus 38 non-ART conceived uh, fetuses. Um, these were uh, abortuses. And what they found was that uh, after assisted reproduction for uh, male infertility, uh, there were 17 out of 78 methylation imprint uh, errors, and in seven cases, the same defect was seen in the father's uh, sperm. So then I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of studies that have been done looking at vulnerable periods in both male and female uh, germlines. Uh, one here uh, from our, our own work looking at exposures to low or very high doses of folic acid, in this case starting in utero, so you go all the way from the beginning of male germ cell development to the end. Sperm was affected, there's a decrease in sperm counts, altered epigenome, and the F2 progeny were also affected. So there's abnormal development, offspring death, and residual uh, uh, epigenetic abnormalities. What about other windows? So here is a study from uh, Radford and uh, colleagues only looking at, at exposure during pregnancy of the male fetus during that period of methylation acquisition and showing in uh, the sperm of this F1 when they grew up that there was locus-specific hypomethylation of DNA and metabolic disease in the F2 adult offspring. So a specific window of time affected. Okay. Um, the female germline is also uh, sensitive to being affected. This is uh, bisphenol A from um, Marisa Bartolome's group, again looking through uh, oocyte development when you acquire DNA methylation patterns um, through this early period of development, and then looking at the fetus here, an increase in imprinting uh, disorders uh, in these mice. If you only look at this period of development, there was no effect suggesting that the female germ cells were um, uh, vulnerable to passing on the, the defect. Okay, so uh, some of the key questions we uh, still have in this uh, area is what is the epigenetic ground state in the primordial germ cells? How do the different uh, epigenetic marks interact to establish the oocyte and sperm epigenome? the impact uh, of different exposures. Um, are all epimutations in sperm and oocytes uh, erased during pre-implantation development? Which ones are not? Are there particular sites in the genome that are hot spots for induction of epimutation or any of these cross species? How reliable is epigenetic reprogramming? Um, are there genotype, epigenotype connections? And we're seeing that that is the case and that has to be looked at carefully and how do sperm RNAs influence uh, the, the offspring. And then I'd just uh, like to uh, thank the people in my group who have been involved in the studies that, that we've done over the years. And thank you. So we're right on time. Uh, the only group that broke for the coffee break is the same coffee we're getting. So, uh, so okay, let's just take a minute for questions before we uh, Part of it could be yes, but they were at higher levels than you would have expected from mutation, but you can't uh, completely uh, rule those, that, that out. But we also saw it with high folate, some of the same DNA methylation type effects with high folate. Is there a 
another question? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I was intrigued by uh, the new data show that now there are some the yeah, so I don't think that we know yet. That was, it was unexpected that uh, there would be these, what they call escapees, mm -hmm. those that escape uh, demethylation uh, at those two, two time points. And so they have to look at them much more, more carefully. But there is concern that they, those areas of the genome may be particularly susceptible. Uh, Carol Spencer. Well, I have a few comments. Um, maybe it's maybe it's something that's very important. You mentioned genome environment and environment and and when the assessment is done, it tends to be one of the most important focus on one more factor. Um, this is an area where one mode of action is different than one mode of action. And you typically want one mode of action that doesn't have one mode of action. Every second pathway tells us to sort of bring together the kind of the same and bring this away from that sort of one mode of action. But I, I don't know how easy you can address this. Because we need to think about all the other things that are going to be in the way and how to do it all together. Sorry, I have a physiological question for you. So there is a blood testis barrier and there is a blood follicle barrier. When does the blood testis barrier develop? And my understanding it is around puberty um, and it's not really well characterized in the females. Do you know? Yes, exactly. Um, but many things can get across the, those barriers. And so I think that you, you have to figure out on a case-by-case -case basis what is getting across the barrier. What can get across. At least for spermatogenesis, spermatogonia, stem cell spermatogonia, which are the, the cell of interest because they last throughout life, they are on the open side of the barrier. So, <laughs> yeah. all right, we've got a question. Yeah. 